this is our Emmy studio, and Bradley, Jesse, Max, you've been nominated for Emmys before. Well, thanks for rubbing what it in and <laughs> seeing them all on the same side, yeah, too. In yeah, case yeah, what was, that's yeah, really nice. That. <laughs> what was it like when you first got that call about your very first nomination? Mm. Um, I, well, it, it was it was uh, it was surreal. I was certainly was not expecting it, um, uh, and um, it, I, it, it was a huge honor. And it was, I I. Uh, I don't think you'll, I'll ever have that same sense of unbridled joy as I did the first time. Obviously, it's been a, a, a huge honor each time, but there's something about that first time. I'd never been nominated for anything in my entire life, so um, you know, to be mentioned in in a in a group a category of people that I respected so much, and you know, have so many of my co-stars uh, along along with me for the ride was was really surreal and amazing. Yeah, I I don't know. It's so odd, you know. You 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 get invited to a lot of. I remember it was, you know, I had been a guest star on so many shows before New Girl, and then the first season of New Girl aired, and then afterwards I was invited to all these like Emmy panels, <laughs> and things like this, and you go, well, this is this is different, and then you go to enough of those things, and you think, well, I, I must have a shot at being nominated, and then when they call you and you are, you go, this is incredibly surreal, but I don't know how surprised I actually was. I think it was more of like. You look at the moment, you look at where you've come from, and now you're nominated for an Emmy, and this is just kind of, it, it, for me, it, I, I don't know, it happened so quickly, and it was such a turn from like, oh, I'm, I'm really excited, I have an audition for a, a callback for JAG. Uh, this wonderful guest star where I, you know what I mean? And I got that sudden, part. You crushed know, it, that's by right. the way. Sorry. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get a phone call like that, and you go, wow, this is... Uh, I was shocked when you were nominated. <laughs> were you really? <laughs> yeah, I got the call that he was nominated. Yeah, I was like, this is kidding? really surreal. But there is something about it where you're like, <laughs> literally. but there is like, there are, there are people who, 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 you know, are like interviewed the next day and they go, it was just, I never saw it coming. Right. Everyone's always well, asleep. you kind of must have because you were in every like magazine with the big Emmy uh, headline on it. You hired a publicist. You, yes, I don't understand. Like, what's, what was so shocking about it all? But when it does happen, it is like, what a sense of gratitude you then have. And you're like, I can't believe, like, it, it's a real reminder of kind of where you've come from and where you are now. And like, man, this is surreal. And Bradley, what's it like to not only get that call, but to win? Uh, uh, it, was <laughs> it was shocking. Uh, um, it was, it, it was shocking because I think when you get lucky enough to have a job that's going well and it's not humiliating and you start going down that road, the, the closer you get to something like that actually happening, the more I think it's not going to happen. I, would, I, I used to fantasize about like uh, Emmy speeches I would like to see. Do you ever, do you ever think? Like... Uh, I want to see somebody go up and just like grab it and say, "Is is this good enough for you, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> Am I a winner now?" And just see how long it takes for them to cut out. Just go. go. <laughs> when did you realize you had something special with your current show? Uh, well, for Orange, uh, it was immediate as soon as it got released because that you know this, this show uh, gets uh, released all at one time. All the episodes get thrown down, so. Um, rather than where uh, on, on network TV or even cable you have a, a weekly wait between each episode, um, this one they dumped all of them. And so it was immediate. Uh, on social media, you could, really, you, could, you could feel it immediately that people were watching the entire season in, in a few hours. And uh, well, 13 hours, I guess, to be exact. And uh, some people were not stopping and watching it. And, and, and that was a really interesting thing to watch is the, the effect uh, when, when it's all released at once, the kind of immediate effect that fans have access to, to respond immediately. I'm curious for you specifically, like the next day, did people cross the street to get away from you? I mean, did you notice an immediate change? <laughs> well, I I'm fortunate enough uh, right now to have two incredibly hideous villains uh, on TV at the same time. And uh, one of them, thankfully, uh, gets lightened by humor. Which, uh, which is, I guess, why I'm here for this one. But uh, yeah, people, people um, definitely try to stay as far away from me as possible. Um, haven't had anything th thrown at me yet, but uh, I'm just waiting for that one. <laughs> we were just very lucky. We, we've, we came out of the gates doing just, just 
Adequate. Perfect. Adequate. <laughs> It, well, it was. I guess I, at the time it was. Uh, we were doing. We were doing really well. It wasn't explosive, but it. It was. It would. If we had continued at that rate, we would have still. I think been on. It just was like, doing doing nice, and uh, the strike happened and actually helped us, um, because there was nothing. They just kept rerunning the show, so it was. We just forced people to, to watch, and then uh, as the season went on, we grew, and then we've been lucky enough. I guess to continue to grow, which is really rare, and that's why I think it's in the headlines that in the seventh season we've actually topped, you know, topped what we did last season and the season before us. Something else all your shows have in common is amazing ensembles. Um, and I'm curious, was, was that chemistry with your cast instantaneous, or did it sort of develop as the show went on? Like, you know, when you, when you met your co-stars, did you, did you instantly feel that connection? Uh, for for my show, I remember when I met uh, Don Cheadle for the first time. Uh, he looked like Don Cheadle, and it was scary as shit because, uh, you know, he's Don Cheadle. But then after that initial moment, the second the four of us were playing or in rehearsal or anything like that, it, we were off to the races, and it was so fun. And I think it was because they let us play, and they let us, like, you know what I mean? Like, the words were amazing and everything like that, but they let you find your characters and find those moments and hanging out with each other. We were actual friends, so I feel like that's a huge element to it. If you can get along with your castmates, I feel like it kind of all molds into each other. So it was pretty uh, quick for us. I think one of the things that uh, determines really good ensemble is obviously really good writing, you know, and, and mm -hmm. in the case of Orange, for sure, um, the thing that makes it such an interesting ensemble is, is the writing staff on Orange, and specifically Genji Cohen, who's, I think, just a phenomenal uh, writer of dialogue. And also, it's such an amazing venue and um, stage for uh, all the women that are on the show, you know, and it's, it's really unique in that way, in that it brings so many different uh, types of women on, on one show together. That, uh, that you don't have, uh, that we've never had on any TV show before. So I think that in, in the case of this show, that's what makes this ensemble, I think, worth, worth watching. I also think it would be a disservice to like, not mention the casting directors in this process because yes. um, and I, 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 uh, I speak for my casting director, Jeff Greenberg, who really took the great, great time to, to on, uh, bring this ensemble of people together from Modern Family. And um, also, th I think the, the stamina that it takes to audition children and oh. we have amazing kids on our show, and I know that they saw so many kids for, for those roles, and, and it really truly was, it was, it was such a testament to how long he took and the, the care he took, because on that first table read, when we first met each other, for, for, we, we, had a, we had a private table read before doing anything for the network, just so we could sort of get to know one another, and it was like speed dating. I was like, how are you, husband? Um, uh, and it, 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 was, it, it really truly felt like we'd known each other for years, and I don't know how... I think it was pure luck, honestly, but there, there was a lot of, um, obviously, skill that went into to putting us together. Listening, I guess, is, is just a huge part of, of what really makes an ensemble feel like an ensemble. When we're on stage, we are listening to each other uh, in real time, and we are, we are playing the scenes you know, as, as truthfully as we can, and, and we believe in the characters and what's happening, and uh, there's... It never, there's never a moment, and I forgot how rare this is, but there never is really a moment where somebody upsets the rhythm or somebody kind of hogs the, the stage. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Where, where were you <laughs> it was I. I'm sorry, do we all want to jump on real quick? You can never be on our show. <laughs> it doesn't ever feel like somebody's trying to show off an ability uh, as opposed to serve the story, I guess. Um, and obviously everybody's really talented, and there is probably some ineffable quality that you can't really put your finger on that happens when an ensemble works. I don't think you can necessarily articulate it, but I think that is all these things, casting, writing, listening, knowing the story you're telling. I don't know. There's, there's a rhythm, and a lot of it is the way the show is run, too. It just, uh, there's a vision for it, so. I'm curious, would you guys be willing to share with us your worst audition story? There was a point when I first moved to out LA specifically that I felt like I really had to go out for every single thing even though I know it was beyond my grasp and beyond my realm of comfort and I just really tried very hard to be whatever they wanted me to be I was like I can morph into this character and I think it was for one of the ba band of um, band of brothers uh, incarnations oh, yes and it was you know I'm just not comfortable like saying dirty words like 
about lady vagina parts, and and I was having to oh say, God. S- oh God. did you I say that? Did you change the words? Well, to what in my part is there? Lady, 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 lady parts. Part what my other part is there? Externally, <laughs> I, I want to touch your lady parts. Oh, okay. <laughs> externally, I'm sure I was like, you know, it was I was pretty. Yeah, a lot of pretty, vagina talk. I wish I almost said Band of Outsiders, which is a designer. Which yeah, is, yeah, yeah. I guess just to show you, which I love. Is I'm actually wearing it. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but in my, I, I, I was yeah, I, I externally I was probably very macho with my sound, but in my head I just sounded like this, and like it just my confidence level was shrinking. And oh, I would love I to watch like, that oh, TV this show. This is terrible. And I think I actually stopped myself. I said I'm gonna leave now, and they I, didn't stop me. They were like, no, 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 you're doing a great job. They're like, okay. My worst audition was um, for a notoriously uh, obnoxious in auditions directors. I don't want to say his name, Oliver Stone. <laughs> um, and I had been warned, you know Billy Hopkins, uh, the uh, casting director. And I walked in and he's scratching his head. And I'd been warned, this is going to be tough. He's tough. And he's. Uh, He's scratching his head over my resume, and he's, he's wearing a kimono. So it's all you can do to say, not say, you know, where'd you get that, Nom? You know. And then he goes, oh, read. And, and so I go, okay, I knew you were going to be a prick. And I, and I start doing it, it's a speech, by <laughs> destroying my career. Uh, and I, I'm doing my speech, and he goes, he goes, stop, stop, stop. It's, Speech at a rally, get back. So I go back, and it was born on the 4th of July, and I'm giving this speech at the rally, and he's like spinning his Rolex and eating salad. And I'm like, okay, and, and I, I, put, I put the thing down, and then he goes, stop, I want you to read this. And it's with Billy Hopkins. Uh, um, and it's a battle scene, which is stupid to read cold, because it's description, description, description. Ah! Description, description, Tommy! No, that's <laughs> good, though. That's good. So, so I'm reading this going, Ugh, two clicks east. Tommy, get on point. And then, uh, Billy Hopkins goes, medevac. I need a medevac. <laughs> and that was the worst audition I ever had. Oh. <laughs> uh, my worst was, uh, was uh, I auditioned for Miracle, the, the hockey movie. Yeah. I don't know if any of you guys did that. Uh, they said they wanted real hockey players. And... No, no, right, yeah, Jews don't play hockey. I got it, I got it, I got it. Um, so uh, I'm Canadian, and so, you know, I figured, I'd, yeah, yeah, I'll play hockey. I can play hockey. Of course I didn't play hockey. Can't even ice skate. So I was in Memphis shooting a movie at the time, so I figured I'd go and take an ice skating lesson so that when I get back to New York, I can, I can do okay in this uh, audition. And I went to, to my ice skating lesson. I was trying to do a, a hockey power stop, which if you've ever tried to do it, it's, it's pretty tough if you haven't done it before. And on my first attempt at a hockey power stop, I, I, I went over tits over ass and, uh, and, and cracked my head open. Oh. Three stitches. Oh. Um, wow. But undeetered, I still decided I would go to the audition. So I get to New York, uh, back from the movie, and uh, I go to the, the audition where they said, we want hockey players who can act. And I get there, and they have the entire New York Rangers minor league team <laughs> oh, is auditioning God. for Miracle. And me and like two other local New York actors. And um, I, I won't tell you why it was the worst audition of my life, but I basically skated around with a bunch of hockey players pretending that I could oh, play hockey. Name, and I remember at the very beginning um, in New York, it's like a rite of par- passage, like audition for Law and Orders or, or all the, at the beginning, especially what you said, like when I was auditioning for commercials and anything, you audition for any, you want to be on TV or any, any way to try to get out there. And I remember I auditioned to be like, a racist, um, a racist character in one of the Law and Orders or w- one of those things, and I remember I did the audition once, and then they go, "Cool, so can you do it just more racist?" And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, okay. I was like, <laughs> and I, I remember I was like, I was doing bits with them in between, like joking, and and then I remember my uh, agent afterwards is like, "If you're going in for like a character that's like racist and angry, maybe don't make them laugh between all the takes or something like that." I was like, "Oh, okay." Um, when I was very young, when I was very young, I, I had a, a Barbara Fiorentino, God bless her heart, was so sweet, called me in to read for a movie called Factory Girl that George Hickenlooper was directing, uh, who's passed away since, and the, both of them were lovely in the audition. And at the time, there was the role which Hayden Christensen ended up playing, but he played a version of what was supposed to be originally 
actually Bob Dylan. And I was young and Jewish and had big hair, and Barbara Fiorentino thought, I'm gonna take a real shot on him. And she, she approached me with like, hey, do you wanna try this out? And of course, like this is by, my biggest mistake, I'm always like, of course I can do that. And then I walk away from the conversation and I go, I, oh my God, what have I done? And for two weeks, I had convinced myself that I was not Bob Dylan to such an extent that I could not, I, and I worked on the material as much, I could not remember a single line. And I got in, and so then I put on my Bob Dylan costume, which was like, oh no, you know, no. some this silly, adorable. some silly, like, you know, I went to like some vintage store and got some like beat up corduroy jacket. Oh, and no. I thought I looked. Trick and you, treat. Yeah, uh, it was horrible. <laughs> it was, it was, it was Halloween. It was Halloween, and then I show up to the audition, and I get there, and there's at least twelve girls in there uh, who are waiting to go in before me to read for Edie Sedgwick, and this was like every beautiful young actress in Hollywood, and I walk in in my Halloween costume, and I'm like. And they all kind of like look at me and they can tell like, oh, who are you? Like, who are you auditioning for? As if they don't know. And I felt like uh, a middle school boy <laughs> who's like, who's like fly was undone at the dance and was just like, this is so, acting was not even a, anything that was even close to in my head at that yeah, point. Kind of yeah, <laughs> it was just, it was so, it was so, it was so bad. <laughs> And then when I got in there, I started doing this bad impression, and I, could, and I was looking at, at George and Barbara, and they were looking at me as if to say, this is, oh, this is, this is so, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, it was like an all oh, sweetheart moment. Good for and him. And it was so sad and horrible, and there was sweat. I'm and sweating I, and then I, I know. Yeah, and, no, and then I had to sing, and I was like, are you sure you want, oh, and it was like, are you sure you Max. want me to sing? And they were like, yeah, you should go for it. Yeah, oh. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, you already dressed cut. up. <laughs> and I was like, I, but I really don't want to. And they're like, yeah, you go for it. Yeah. And then I had to do that. And, and how empowering that you get to tell this at this variety yeah. round table for the No, it still award. hurts. Oh, it, it really hurts. Still, it, still, it still hurts. And it was fully on me. So uh, if you guys want to pick up your phones in front of you, uh, Sorry, we, have oh, question, no, okay. we have questions. What is your favorite episode last season and why? Hashtag Variety Studio. I think I, I would be doing uh, my show a disservice to not say the, my wedding. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that uh, our uh, our writers did a really great job with with the wedding. They they had a, um, it certainly was the whole arc of the season was moving toward that, and I was just really proud that they they didn't over politicize it, and it was very simple. And it was they they really let it breathe. They let Eric and I actually say vows to one another probably knowing that they wouldn't keep half of it, but just allowing us to, to, to go through the emotions of what it is to get married. And um, it, it just felt like a real full circle moment um, for those characters. And uh, I'm just really proud of the work that really the writers did with it. And Eric, and then me last. <laughs> what was your favorite scene to film last season? There was a scene um, that was highly enjoyable where I was left alone with uh, Zoe's character, Jess, and I was, she was like looking over me as if to keep me put and not let me out of the house to go run down Cece, Hannah Simone's character, and she was supposed to like keep me entertained. And we shot like so many different versions of her just like tap dancing and all this stuff, like all this crazy stuff, and me just sitting on a couch like infuriated with her and like what like but also sl like slightly amused and confused and all these different emotions and like at one point we're like both crying and it was just it was it was a fun like two hours of just ridiculousness if you weren't an actor what would you be doing hashtag variety studio at yuza wants to know that but so do i <laughs> at jesse tyler follow me on twitter if i wasn't an actor i think i'd have to be i, I would just travel man i just got back from australia and, mm. and i realized you know, it was i was fortunate enough to be there for work but um and that's wonderful when we get to travel for work because we get to see things but I realize how much I, I'm missing of the world by uh, being so focused on my career and, 
and work, and especially TV becomes a very uh, overwhelming schedule. But when I do get to get away, it, it really just makes me realize how, how much there is in the world and how much I'm not seeing every day that I'm just focusing on my career. So you become worldly. I become worldlier. <laughs> <laughs> if you had another job on your show, whose would it be? Hashtag, hashtag Variety Studio. I would um, be, try to find a way to get on that writing staff because I think House of Lies is written so beautifully. It's set up by Matthew Carnahan and stuff like that. And then um, I have uh, some writing experience. I've randomly, I didn't, I've randomly won an Emmy for writing uh, in the past. So uh, I would love to be around a group because many times I'm by myself. So it would be so fun to be in a group of people um, writing for that show because I do agree. I think the writing is pretty sharp, man. And then you have people like Cheadle and Kristen saying your words, which is a dream for a writer. So uh, I would try to be um, the lowest totem, person on totem pole on that writing staff. <laughs> Samsung Galaxy guys are going to love this. What was your first job? Says at Samantha, uh, hashtag Variety Studio. First job was uh, in a play. Uh, I was very exciting with Kathy Bates, Sam Shepard called Curse of the Starving Class, where I had to urinate on stage and walk around buck naked, squat, and pick up a lamb, who I called Meryl Sheep. 